Hello and welcome back to JLXP. Final episode here from Korea. World Championship was last night. Faker won his fourth World Championship. Just an amazing day. Even if the series itself, gameplay-wise, wasn't the most competitive, I think the story was the most compelling it has been in a very long time. I'm going to talk in depth about that later in the episode. I'm going to do a bit of a game-by-game -game breakdown for this series, even though they weren't amazingly close. I still think there's some interesting stuff. And I'm also going to look back a little bit at the World Championship because I think there's a lot of stories that might be forgotten that I just want to talk about again before I go home. And just a reminder, JLXP is here on the JLXP channel. There's also a bunch of stuff that I filmed yesterday at the World Championship with a bunch of different pro players that were there. There were a lot of people at the World Championship. It was a really cool event. And that's going to be on the Let's Go series over on the LCS YouTube channel. I'd say last week's Let's Go episode was probably my favorite of all of them when we were there. Uh, kind of captured lightning in a bottle when T1 beat JDG. And anyway, that series is over on the LCS channel. Check that out as well. And without further ado, let's get into the podcast. So, Worlds is over. T1 and Faker... They're, they're four-time world champions, which is just going to be so difficult for any other individual to replicate. I'm, I want to say that it will never happen, but records are made to be broken. So maybe there's going to be a point 15, 20 years in the future when someone wins their fifth world championship, or maybe they'll need six or seven if Faker somehow keeps going and wins more. But the fact that Faker... In 2013, was the youngest mid laner to ever win a world championship. And that's still true today. There's never been a younger mid laner to win a world championship since Faker did in 2013 at the age of 17. And now Faker's also the oldest player to ever win worlds. The same player from the start of his career to this point in his career is incredible. And how did they do it? I think they were incredibly close last year. But the defeat that they had, I think, ended up changing their mindset a little bit. I was on Twitter a lot last night trying to read up as much as I could about press conference and all the different takes. And one thing Faker actually credited this year was commitment to his process and not getting completely wrapped up in the wins and losses. And I think that's actually a pretty shared sentiment you see across a lot of different great players is they commit completely to their process because that's the thing they fall in love with. If you fall in love too much with the victory and the defeat and the ups and downs, then I think you burn out at a faster rate. I think if you're winning too much, sometimes you can lose motivation. And if you're losing too much, sometimes you can get overly frustrated. But if you just love waking up every day, thinking about your craft, executing and excelling at your craft, and you just get addicted to that loop, that's one of the places you get real greatness. I think another place you get a stronger attachment in terms of fandom is superstars like Faker, and this is across all sports, that are able to have their whole career with the same team. And I was really thinking about this because of how long Faker's legacy has been and the ups and downs that have happened in Korean League of Legends and esports. And just the fact that he was basically there for Korea's first world championship, like a year after they got the server, never went to China. So for those of you who don't know, like 10 years ago, at the 2014 world championship, there was the Samsung White and the Samsung Blue teams from Korea. And they were basically the two best teams in the world. And after that 2014 world championship, all 10 of those players went to the LPL. Because at that moment in time, the LPL was like, we want to pass the LCK, we're just going to buy it. Uh, and all those players got bought by the LPL. And I think all of those players are no longer playing. But Faker stayed in Korea. He stayed on T1. Whether, it's got to be a combination of things. It's got, it, it's got to be some level of loyalty, some level of him accepting less, and some level of T1 paying more to him than other Korean players would have paid. I actually have no idea how much Faker 
makes, how much he's made. T1 and Faker have been very good about keeping that quiet, but it doesn't actually matter to the average fan. What matters is that you've had the same presence to look at on the same team and he's played 11 years for that org. It's incredible for League of Legends. It gives this amount of continuity and increased attachment. And I think it just makes it so much, just, just a little bit sweeter, actually. But it enhances the overall story to be, you know, even greater than what it already would be. I got a lot of faker things, so I'm going to try and keep it in some level of order. Uh, I have a, a bit of a weird take but I do wonder if if Faker's summer split injury in a way helped T1 reach their greatest peak ever for these five players that have been together for two years. So as I mentioned in the previous podcast, this core of owner Faker, Gumakaria, and for two years, Zeus, for two and a half years, they had a different top laner, uh, went to five straight LCK finals, they made it to five international tournaments. And prior to this world championship, they had only won once. They've been to eight finals. They'd only won one. Now they've been to nine finals and they won two. And the world championship is obviously the most important. Uh, and then also through my conversations with Huni, through seeing some wicked voice comms from Faker in their JDG win, where he called like 30 seconds before he was going to flip ruler back in the mid lane that he was going to look for a fight. He gave everyone just incredible notice that it was going to happen and he saw the play when no one else saw it. Uh, but playing with Faker, and this has been true since 2017 and is especially more important for super young players, he just makes the game easy for everybody else because he will make the important decisions, right? He will be able to see the correct angle for team fights. He will be able to know where the team can go on the map and he will even be as in the weeds as at four minutes telling his top laner that he can get push and that once he gets push, he could come in for a dive and then they're going to be able to dive the enemy mid laner like a minute later. So as Huni was describing it, it just simplifies the game so much for the individual that you just have to worry about your own individual matchup that kind of allows you to hit a slightly higher level than if you're trying to think about the whole game. However, when Faker was gone, they really did struggle. They went uh, one and seven in match score and four and 14 in game score. But the way that I would say this may have actually helped them is even though they weren't necessarily at, at all skilled in being able to actually win the game as a team, there would have been little things as they actually won some of those games or as they struggled in some of those games where they're learning a bit more like how to find their own angles and how to make their own decisions a bit more than they would if they had been playing with Faker the entire time. So it's almost like resistance training, right? Like they're weighed down a little bit when they're needing to make all their own shot calls. And even if they're failing, they're like still building up those muscles. Yet then when Faker comes back, it's almost like they're taking the weights off and they're moving faster. That would be, that would be the analogy. Who knows? Who knows how true it actually is, but it was a thought of like, maybe it did actually help them a little bit in the long run to have this dip of struggle and then being able to get Faker back and make, make the final run. Going into the series, I watched, I watched a lot of draft analysis stuff and the general consensus was that T1 was going to be favored in draft. Uh, the series was going to generally revolve around uh, mid lane picks, because Faker had only played three champions, only two games on Silas, five games on Ori, five games on Azir. So high likelihood that Faker's champion pool was at least going to be checked. Uh, we know he's played like 80 different champions on stage all time of his career because he's played like 1,200 games. Um, but most recently, and especially since injury, he'd had a very small champion pool. So you needed to check Faker's champion pool. The other big question was going to be like, how does Weibo deal with bot lane picks? Because even in the BLG series, uh, they were trying stuff that was wildly new to them. The range support meta seemed to be brought on by T1, but also pretty succeeded by 
uh, what Weibo was able to do, Crisp was playing some pretty good range supports. So there was supposed to be a lot of jockeying around what bot lane picks you're going to do. And then I think there was a small question of owner has just been so good on like Poppy Rel. If you take him off Poppy Rel or like Poppy Rel Sejuani, like what's next? And I think with those things in mind, the game one draft from Weibo as Weibo had won the coin toss and was able to select blue side and prep pretty extensively for game one. I thought they nailed it based on those things. Like game one itself, Weibo banned Jarvan, Azir, Silas. So they got rid of Faker's main champion pool because T1 basically had always been banning Nico. They banned Nico, Oriana, Rumble. So four mid lane bans taken right off the bat and immediately Faker's put on something else. Faker ends up dropping down to four or five in the draft. He picks Ari. It's his first Ari pick the whole tournament. Uh, because T1 prioritized their bot lane super early with a Callista Renata, it also me meant that uh, Jungle got to be target banned out in the second phase of bans by Weibo as well. They banned Sejuani Rel. So T1's comp ended up being like Callista Renata bot lane, Ari Lee Sin mid jungle with a Yone top lane. And that was just so different than the things they had been specifically succeeding on. And from a scaling perspective, Weibo with Santa Tom Kench, Aatrox, Jace, and Maokai felt like they just had better frontline. Uh, the Senna, if played to the really high level, can shut down Callista. And I thought they just cooked. I thought Danny cooked in that draft. And if, if they were equal skill teams, like if they both played a 50-50 game, that was going to be a Weibo win. Yet that game was a 30-minute T1 victory because they skill checked them you know, super hard and they won all the clutch team fights. Yeah, this podcast is going to be, you're going to be listening to this, you know, probably four days since the game. So I won't go too in depth on the individual moments of the game because it will be difficult to recall. But uh, there was, there was one particular play when the game was incredibly close and Zeus Sizione was like one and two or oh and two and he had like basically a 1v3 at Dragon where he was able to kill Senna by a bunch of time and allow T1 to come in and sweep up the rest of the fight that uh, was a bad omen, I would say, for Weibo. Zeus was just creating so much space on Yone, basically making it have the same function as a frontline champion because you had to pay so much attention to him and he was stopping the enemy carries from functioning, which if you think about it, if he was a tank frontline and he's just spaced in the right spot, like they're going to take a long time hitting him, but he just had so much threat that they were pulling off the same thing, even though they were playing a team comp with like without a good frontline and without a tank, but their team fighting was still incredible because they were playing on the margins so well. Game two, probably the most one-sided game of the series. And this is where T1 again picks like, some pretty crazy stuff that other teams weren't really winning with this whole tournament. Their, their overall team comp at the end ended up being Renata Draven bot lane, Silas mid, and then Nocturne Gwen. So it was a Nocturne comp, but it didn't necessarily have like immediate powerful team fighting, like a Nocturne Rel or Nocturne Oriana that we see a lot of the time. But Faker was able to steal enough Maokai or Arialts with his Silas. Nocturne was always going in when Zeus already had an angle with Gwen. So they'd always have enough threat on any backline target that they need to get during any particular fight. And they just, they kind of smashed Weibo. I think weirdly enough, the turning point in game two, I think a lot of people would remember this play is when Nocturne tries to dive top lane. Uh, Gwen, and, Gwen and Nocturne are diving the Aatrox. The Shy actually outplays the gank perfectly. He gets a double knockup with his Aatrox as Gwen and Nocturne are trying to kill him under turret and he's safe. But then as the wave is crashing, he just ease forward and dies to Gwen. Gives up first blood. I think gives back the momentum in the game. Maybe if he doesn't do that, they still lose, right? But it definitely felt like once that happened, you're thinking, all right, this series is, is most likely over. Game three kind of just confirmed it. Uh, again, Owner played his second Lee Sin game. Zeus got his third counter pick in a row. He fifth picked the Aatrox against the Shy's Kennen. Um, he got counter pick all three games in this series, which is pretty important. And even though I'd say Weibo looked a bit better early in this game, 
Uh, they, at this point, had picked so hard for lane because they'd been getting skill checked and beaten in lane so much that when the team fights started happening, uh, T1 could just flank the hell out of them. Lee Sin, Aatrox, Akali, Rakan, they were just coming at them from all angles and and Wibble didn't have a chance. So all told, a really dominant series from T1, uh, only 30 seconds slower than the fastest world's best of five ever. Both of the fastest best of fives in world's history have had the shy and they've been in Korea, which is kind of a fun fact. So the shy was, was the victor in the fastest world finals of all time, 2018 in Korea against Fnatic. And now he falls to T1 in the second fastest best of five of all time at worlds. Just in unreal worlds from T1. I wanted to compare it a bit to their other world championships because you can, because they've been in eight. Uh, so this world's overall game score was 13 and two. Slightly different format than we've had in previous world championships because it's a Swiss rather than group stage. So the number of games is going to be a little different. 2013, which they won, 15 and three. They won that world's. 2015, 15 and one. That was their highest win rate of any world championship. They only dropped one game the entire time. It was in the finals. It was so close to being a perfect Worlds, but the Koo Tigers took a game off them. 2016 was their hardest Worlds win based on how many games they lost. They actually lost six games across that entire Worlds. They went 14 and six. Uh, the Worlds where they didn't make it very far, 11 and eight in 2017, they lost in finals. Nine and five in 2019, they lost in semifinals. 10 and four in 2021, but they lost in game five to Dom Juan, the eventual world champion, or the eventual team that lost to EDG in the finals. Everyone thought they were going to be the eventual world champions in that year. Um, last year, actually really strong worlds until finals, 13 and five. And then obviously this year, 13 and two. So based on win percentage, it would actually be T1's second most dominant worlds ever. And I'd say with the Swiss stage, actually the overall uh, difficulty of opponents is a little higher because you're not going to have any of those dead games when you've already qualified for the quarterfinals and you're playing, you know, Fenerbahce again or something. Uh, so they always had to play against a top opponent. 11 and one against LPL, I think, which is just incredible. The T1 quadra killed the LPL 2-0 against BLG, 3-0 against LNG, 3-1 against JDG and 3-0 against Weibo. And that's one, one other thing with this world championship that I think is, is really, it's got to feel good for LCK fans in terms of the LCK versus LPL rivalry. More specifically though, for T1 fans, because yes, in this world, they did the ultimate 4v1, eliminating three of the LPL teams outright in quarters, semis, and finals. But if you go back to last year, T1 also eliminated RNG in quarters and JDG in semis. In the last two years, T1 has individually eliminated five LPL teams from the world championship. Faker has still yet to lose a best of five to an LPL team in world's history. He's been to eight of them. It's never happened. One of the most impressive streaks ever, as you know, Faker does have a long list of those. Final thoughts on some of the players throughout this, this series and kind of what it means for their legacy. Uh, Zeus did win world's final MVP. I voted for him to win world finals MVP. I think he would have had a lot of demons from last year where Kingen won the MVP against him. I think he was labeled by a choker as a choker by many people. I think he did actually choke. He played way below his level last year. This year, I think specifically going up against a top lane legend like the Shy. I think the fact that Weibo thought they got enough draft advantages in other areas by picking blue side all three games and then allowing Zeus to counterpick the Shy, not the Shy counterpicking Zeus, did a lot of good for him. He went 16, 4, and 17 on Yone, Gwen, and Aatrox. He dominated lane. There were several games where he was up double digit CS. I think the overall CS gap across three games was in the hundreds 
it was ridiculous how much he was able to extend his lead outside of landing phase. And then also just clean up team fights. Like I think a super well-deserved MVP from Zeus. Loved his interview at the end as well, where he said, you know, today I'm the greatest top leader in the world. In a couple of days, I'm just going to be back in with the challengers again. Uh, that was the translation that Huni had given me while we were listening to the interview. So he should stay hungry for next year. So yeah, he went 16, three and 23. The shy went one 16 and five. We'll get to the shine a bit. Owner on the series, 16 kills, three deaths, 23 assists. Lee Sin, Nocturne, Lee Sin. Uh, best tournament of his life. One of the best tournaments the jungler's ever had at Worlds, actually. I think because the Faker story is so amazing. I think because Zeus wins MVP. I think because Caria is such a fan favorite. We didn't get to talk about Owner that much. But for someone who was so despised, really, by a lot of T1 fans, he did so much good. Hoonie said last week that he took a lot of the, that owner took a lot of the risk on himself this tournament. And he was able to succeed with that. And I think that's really true. Like even picking Lee Sin twice in the finals, going in for the big plays, making the early ganks happen, consistently invading the other jungler. Like he was really on point. And I think his jump to the elite tier. Without that jump, I don't know if T1 wins. I don't know if they win their fourth world title. So amazing job by owner. Faker, eight kills, three deaths, 19 assists on Ari, Silas, and Akali. It's, I don't know, it's almost fitting that uh, of the three series, this was probably Faker's worst. Still amazing. We still don't know we, we can still never truly measure like what he's individually doing in each series. We know what Faker does to this team. They were one of the worst teams in the LCK before he came back from injury and now they're world champions. So like you almost want to give him the MVP just because of that fact. But like you can't make that assumption when you're voting for the MVP. Faker still played well, don't get me wrong. But compared to the rest of his teammates, the gap between him and his lane opponent or him and the other players in the game, uh, you know, the other four members of T1 had probably better series than Faker. But it, just to be clear, that doesn't take anything away from Faker. It's still, still an incredible achievement and an amazing world. The fact that Faker in his 11th Worlds was the best mid at the tournament, uh, or at least the most clutch. The really interesting thing is I'd, I'd had this impression that Faker was like, wow, he's the best man at the tournament. And I think a lot of our stats either don't show this or the Faker impact is just so strong because like he didn't average like a CS advantage. He didn't average a gold advantage. Um, he was really average in all those stats. It was like minus 20 gold at 14 and like plus one CS or something like all right middle tier. 24% um, of his team's damage, which is like, 11th out of the 16 mid laners that are here. Uh, not a crazy DPM. Like nothing jumped off the page. Yet in game, he's jumping off the page. That's just a faker thing. He knows exactly how to win the game. Guma, this one actually is, is a little strange to me. He didn't die. 7015, Callista Draven Zaya. I don't think he made any mistakes. Like, in a closer series, in a series where Zeus isn't 100 CS ahead of the shy or owner isn't making amazing engages, I think Guma actually would have had a real shot at MVP, but he just never had to do it. He was always like a little bit ahead. He was always in the right place, but he was never put in a situation where he could actually make a case for himself to win series MVP, if that makes sense. He played basically perfect. So incredible worlds for him. Like that's the ascension that, that people are waiting for. I think uh, he had that in the last series against JDG. He had that Varus play where he 1v2'd Aatrox and Ruler Zeri. And in the T1 voice comms, I read the subtitles for it. After he did that, he just like really called me like, oh, yep, got him. I'm the alpha. And his, his rivalry, I talked to Ashley Kang about this as well. He had this like pretty big rivalry with Ruler where like, He's just, you could tell like that's the guy he had his, his sights set on. Like if I beat this guy, then I'm the greatest JD carry. Um, and now he is. Especially at this moment in time, Guma. Guma's the best. 
Caria, 0-2-35, Renata, Renata, Rakan. Really incredible play. Uh, I think beyond just this series, Caria changed the meta at this tournament. It's something we'll never really be able to know. Like, does the meta change to suit a team or does a team change the meta to suit them? And there's been previous world championship teams. Like if I take FPX in 2019, Akali was one of the most played champions that whole tournament. Doinby never played Akali. Doinby just played Nautilus. And he made his style work in FPX won worlds. But you wouldn't say Nautilus was the strongest champion on the patch. But nobody could beat Doin Beyond Nautilus. And this year, in Swiss stage and playing stage, everyone was playing Alistair, Leona, Rel, Botlane, Rakan. And he plays Caitlyn, he plays Ash, he plays Bard. Uh, other teams have been playing Renata. It had been banned pretty frequently, but because all of the madness had happened throughout the series, people kind of realized that like, we can't do anything about this carrier guy. He's just going to be able to look at the team comp, pick the best support and win the game. And I think because he did all of that, he like gets rewarded by being able to play actually the strongest support on the patch in Renata twice in finals and, and bring it home. I'm so happy for Caria, especially with how shattered he was last year to be able to do what he did here. I want to touch on the Weibo guys that I touched on last episode as well in terms of legacy because a uh, few things they fell short on. The Shy, I said if he wins a second world championship as a carry top player, he's probably the greatest top player of all time. I think that would have been true, but it didn't happen. So he's not. He had a really bad world final. One kill, 16 deaths, five assists. He never got any counter picks, which hurts. But to win a world championship, you got to be able to win with blind picks or with counter picks a lot of the time. He played poorly overall. It was a bit of a miracle run for him to make it back this far. Uh, it was a really nice story, the Shao resurgence, but just fell short. I think Shao Hu as well, man. This one's got to hurt. He's still a three-time MSI champion. He's now a world finalist as well. He still has the second most international games of any player, only to Faker. I think he has five domestic titles, but without the world title, he just doesn't have enough to get over the edge. He had two kills, six deaths, one assist. He was only a part of three of Weibo's 11 kills. So you can't even say he was like, ah, you know, he really stood up and had a great series, but they just fell short. He just couldn't do it once again. And we'll see if he gets back to this point. I think in the last podcast, I'd mentioned that uh, with the win, he might be in the conversation for second greatest player of all time. Without the world title, he's not even close. So that loss, I think, hurts... It might hurt Shaohu's legacy more than it hurts anyone else's legacy on that team, if that makes sense. It's a little unfair, but that's just the way the cookie crumbles. The Shy already has a world championship. Crisp already has a world championship. Crisp got outplayed by Caria. He played Tom Kent, Senna, and Bard. Uh, it's really hard to match Caria and what T1 was doing. I thought Crisp did a lot of really good work on range supports throughout the bracket stage to help Weibo get to this point. But it was just a team gap. Like, there was no one on Weibo that I saw who really outplayed their counterpart on T1, even in the early game consistently. Like none of them were able to get big advantages uh, to give Weibo a, a real chance. I do want to make one correction before I forget. Last week I said, uh, you know, of top laners to win two world championships, the Shy will be the first top laner. Duke did win two world championships. Thank you to all the viewers who corrected that. Uh, he was a sub on IG in 2018, but did play a meaningful role for that team when the Shy was out with injury. He played a lot. He was even playing playoff games. He was even playing group stage games for IG during that world championship. So he is also a two-time world champion. Uh, I don't think that changes the conversation of greatest top player of all time. I don't think it is Duke, but I do think that that is valid. And 
One final thing on T1 before I get to the, the rest of the world's recap is, uh, I don't know if this team stays together. I think they have a way higher chance of staying together with a win than they would have if with a loss. Uh, it'll be really interesting to factor, to, to watch the offseason for this team because the situation that T1 is in is so different than other sports. Like, uh, if I were to consider, you know, an NBA player, like, even if you're playing for the most popular team, you can still go to, like, a big market team and that team's going to have, like, roughly the same amount of fans. But, like, the current profile of T1 is so high compared to basically any other team in the LCK that these guys could go to. Um, some of them might want to go to the LPL. I think, I think one underrated thing uh, that I wouldn't actually fault one of the T1 players for if they do indeed not play on T1 next year, because like a lot of their contracts are up, like they're going to be up for renegotiation. There could be factors completely unrelated to desire that determine where these players end up going. But like to be on a team with Faker for as great of a blessing as it is, and as much as an experience you'll have that no other players will be able to have, you'll still never be in fans' eyes the reason the team wins. It's always going to be faker. And I think an example of this was, uh, you know, last week, a lot of us casters were having these conversations about greatest teams of all time, greatest players of all time, second greatest players of all time, greatest players in their role. And the dive ended up having, or the dive for you pog state, that podcast they were doing, um, had this conversation about like greatest team of all time. And they started talking about 80 carries and they mentioned ruler. They mentioned Uzi. They didn't mention bang. Bang won two world championships with T1. But he won them with Faker. And I think, like, when you really think about it, you're like, yeah, absolutely, Bang should be in that conversation. He completely deserves it. But in the public consciousness, you did it with Faker, right? Zeus was world's MVP, but he was with Faker. You know? So I think forging your own legacy could be a thing for T1 players in the future. Personally, I would love to see them run it back. Uh, we've already kind of gotten more than we can expect though. There's this uh, chart that all Sports stats put out that I retweeted. It shows total number of MSI and Worlds games played on the bottom and then win percentage on the top. And the most up and to the right by a wide margin is these five players on T1. They've already played together for so long. Um, it's already somewhat unprecedented in esports for them to spend two complete calendar years as a five-man team playing year-round in every international tournament. Um, it may be the end of it. One stat I have to get to because I promised our stat guy, Liam, that I was going to get to it. And it's just a cool faker stat. Please tell me I have it. <laughs> so faker has faced 51 different mid laners at MSI and Worlds. He has a winning record against 42 of them. 100% win rate against 27 of them. Five of them have a tied record. And there are only four mid laners he has a losing record against all time at MSI and Worlds. Can you guess? Caps. He's seven and nine against Caps. He's two and three against Showmaker and Zeka. And the player all time that has the best international win rate against Faker is Crown. <laughs> the guy who beat him in the 2017 World Championship, three to zero. Pretty funny. Okay, that's it for T1. It's been an amazing year for them. One of the best stories and scripts of all time. But Worlds itself, it was really fun, honestly. I think the Swiss stage was a big boost to the overall quality of the first two weeks of the tournament. I would say in previous years, the first week of group stage was always awesome. If you were lucky, the second week would have a good day. But if you were unlucky, there'd be a team that wins their first game on their final day of groups. They go 4-0. and That clinches them to make it through. The other team is at 0-4. They're eliminated. And you basically know 
the two teams that are going to advance and you have like five hours worth of dead games. This Swiss format ensured that we never had a dead game, which was just absolutely amazing for keeping the overall entertainment value up. I think it's probably good to add some more protections to the Swiss stage overall. I think, you know, the things that they're going to be considering are uh, maybe blocking some interregional matchups a little bit later into the Swiss stage, maybe blocking the possibility of rematches. Personally, though, I haven't ran the simulations for that. Maybe it ends up really messy, but I think there are real ways they can improve it. Uh, I think, fingers crossed, if I'm wrong, then I'm wrong. But I, I know they're going to be looking at that because they're willing to change formats. They changed the format and I think it was better. I think the thing we can't forget about this world championship though is energy. They freaking did it, man. They went four and one in Swiss. And yes, they did lose in quarterfinals to an eventual finalist in Weibo. But I think where we were as LCS fans before this world championship and our relationship with G2 and Europe was really down in the dumps. The general feeling when energy drew G2, you know, I, I was really hoping and championing that like, this is the only way they can change the narrative. Like you have to be able to beat G2 if NA wants to be better than EU or even to, to make that a consideration. I'd say a lot of people and even me in the back of my mind was like, ah, it would also really suck to have G2 get through to quarters by beating NA. But energy didn't let those demons affect them. They knocked G2 down, contributed to G2 not making it to quarters. They did it with NA talent in the mid lane. Palafox contracts Dokla. Even FBI, he's like, I think of the OPL, original OPL players from Australia, he's been in North America longer than any of them. Still really proud of them. I don't think people should forget what they're able to do. I think the other two teams at Worlds, Frene, TL, and Cloud9 did have disappointing showings. Team Liquid overall game score one and four, including getting eliminated by GAM. They were by far the most disappointing. They're going to retool for next year, I'm sure. And Cloud9 had a rough series against Fnatic. Uh, luckily, Energy did beat G2 and most people forgot about that. But I want to be complete, right? I thought C9 played pretty below their level against Fnatic. They lost that series one to two and they got themselves eliminated before they had a chance to play a best of three to make it to quarterfinals. I, I kind of want to just express some gratitude to, to the fans of this world championship. I thought the positivity was higher than in previous years. Even when things weren't going well for Team Liquid or for Cloud9, I didn't think people were rubbing them in their faces, pushing them into the dirt. I think in my conversation with Demonte on the train, like he agrees, narrative matters. So not being doom and gloom all the time and supporting a team in a realistic fashion is definitely something that I think a lot of fans can aspire to. It's not that you can't be disappointed. It's not that you can't want a team to win. It's not that you can't be crushed when they lose. But the way in which you express your fandom to players with how, with how tethered we all are to the internet really does matter. So I thought that was an improvement this year. And I want to express gratitude for that. I also want to thank the fans for watching JLXP. I, uh... I took a long time off the podcast this year. And the fact that I was able to come to Worlds, start doing this podcast again and have people watch and be happy for it um, was really great. I'm really, I'm really grateful for the community of you all that, that watch this podcast and tune in when I'm able to make it. I also want to thank really the LCS team and all the people behind the camera. If you haven't noticed, the production quality on this podcast has gone way up. And that's not me. <laughs> that is the LCS team uh, working wonders to set all this up. Line up podcast guests. Do a podcast on a freaking train. How cool is that? Also the team that made Let's Go. I think it captured lightning in a bottle a couple times. Faker, energy beating G2. The fact that we were there for those moments. Uh, I really want to thank 
the LCS for, you know, asking me to do the Let's Go project. I think it worked out really well at this world championship. I hope we can do stuff like that again in the future. Um, but overall, you know, this is the first time I've spent significant time in Korea since 2014. And it's just been a really cool journey being here for five weeks. Uh, my own personal journey in esports uh, really started in Korea. In 2011, I played for the North American team, one of the two North American teams in the World Cyber Games in Busan. And that's actually the event that I cast my first League of Legends game. Uh, it was like a third place match with D-Man because Joe Miller was getting called to cast some other esport. And I just kind of fell in love with it from there. So uh, really sentimental trip for me, getting to spend a lot of time in Korea, you know, 12 years after I started my journey in esports. So thanks to everyone for watching, for supporting, to the LCS team, to Worlds, to T1, to Faker, to Energy, to everyone. This has been such a great journey. See you next year.